we prepare our hearts for God's word this morning, let us pray together the prayer for illumination. Together. God of all power, open our ears, our eyes, and our hearts with the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Help us to hear your voice, to see your ways, and to receive with joy your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as I hand the time over to Pastor Ben. Thank you, Jenny, for leading us in a time of worship. And welcome everyone once again to the house of the Lord, even as we look at God's word for us this morning. Well, we are beginning a new sermon series. And over the next four weeks, we'll be looking at a sermon series called God Cares. God Cares for us. God Cares today for the brokenhearted. That's what we'll be looking at today. God Cares for the overwhelmed. God cares for the bullet, and God cares for the tired. And as we look at how God does care for us, we want to pray that God will speak into all of our lives, especially those of us who feel brokenhearted, overwhelmed, bullet, or tired in this season of our lives. And I pray that uh, if you know of any friends or loved ones who is experiencing these uh, in the seasons of their life right now, won't you bring them to the service so that they might also hear how God cares for them as well. Today, we are looking at how God cares for the brokenhearted. And for our reflection, we'll be looking at Psalm 34, three verses, Psalm 34, verses 18 to 20. And so, because it's only three verses, so we read it all together as the people of God. Ready? One, two, three. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in the spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones and not one of them is broken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. In her article in Salt and Light, in sharing her testimony, Lydia opened with these words. She wrote, I thought miscarriage was the sort of thing that only happened to other people. Then it happened to me. Twice. In 2019, five years ago, Lydia and her husband were expecting her, their second child. But at eight weeks, it was detected that the child in the womb no longer had any heartbeat. The child had died in the womb. And at a point in time, Lydia wrote these words in her journal. I can't pretend that I understand God's plan and purpose in this, but I do know and feel that my God had not forsaken me. I know I have more questions than answers, but I do not need answers now because that's not what sustains me. And as she wrote, little by little, God's word became a balm to my wounded heart. Promises like these carried me in my grief, and she quoted Psalm 34 verse 18 the psalm that we just read, the verse that we just read. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those crushed in spirit. Six months later, they were pregnant with another baby, was born in 2020. And in 2022, she was pregnant again with another child. She carried that child all the way to 25 weeks in the womb. 25 weeks. And then her water bag burst at 25 weeks. And the child died in her womb. January the 1st, 2023, was the day in which she had to still give birth to the child. 
And she wrote, the day began with painful contractions that eventually led to Lucas' birth. But Lucas had already passed on in the womb. The whole process was the same as childbirth and more, and I did not have epidural. So it was painful. I cried and I cried as I held my baby boy after delivery. My heart was broken in a way I could not describe. There were truly no words to describe the weight of the grief, having to give birth to a child, knowing that he would never be able to live on. And she said, I will always remember the moment as I held Lucas in my arms. He had such defined features, his daddy's thick eyebrows and my nose bridge. He was much bigger than we expected and was so perfect in every way. We hugged and kissed him. We wept, and I believe Jesus wept too and he saw our deep sorrow. Lydia wrote, I cried and cried as I helped my baby boy after delivery. My heart was broken in a way I could not describe. Different of us experience broken heartedness in our lives at various seasons of our lives. Broken hearts can and often come because there have been deaths. Deaths of a loved one. This could be a baby who, is, who has died in the womb or a loved one who has died in old age. Regardless, deaths of a loved one results in broken heartedness. It could be a death of a relationship between a husband and a wife between a parent and a child, between boyfriends and girlfriends, deaths of relationships often results in broken-heartedness. It could be a death of a dream. And reading just a few days ago that uh, Singapore Airlines had given their staff eight months bonus reminded me of a dream they had. I dreamed as I was growing up, that one day I would be a pilot. At primary six, I was told that I had to wear glasses and that dream died in me. You know, at that time, there wasn't any uh, uh, LASIK at all, right, to correct eyesight. And I felt the dream died in me and I cried and I cried for one whole day. I felt as if my heart had been broken to many, many pieces. I remember I told my mom, I don't want to eat. I don't want to go out. I don't want to study. Because my dream had died. And I felt that my heart was broken. Sometimes it could be a death of self. When our self-esteem dies, when there's something in us that no longer feels right, we feel that we can no longer live with ourselves. And sometimes... Perhaps oftentimes, that leaves us in states of grief and brokenheartedness. And David, the King David, the, babe, the boy David who fought Goliath and one day would be king, in the intermediary, in the intermediary, there was a time where he was brokenhearted as well. And we see that in Psalm 34. And yet, at the start of Psalm 34, it says here, that the title is, Taste and see that the Lord is good. How can King David, whom this psalm is attributed to, title his psalm, Taste and see that the Lord is good, when in the psalm he says that he's brokenhearted. And he says here of David, when he changed his behaviour before Abimelech, so that he drove him out. Abimelech drove David out. And David went away. This episode is recorded for us in 1 Samuel chapter 21. You see, in 1 Samuel chapter 21, the background is this, that David had been serving the prevailing king, Saul. And Saul was the king at the point in time, but Saul was insecure. And because 
David had slayed Goliath. People were singing that Saul had slayed his thousands and his hundreds, but David had slayed his thousands. And so Saul was insecure and Saul wanted to kill David, even though David was serving in his court. And so David had to flee from Saul, leaving his best friend behind. His best friend was Jonathan, the son of Saul. He had to leave his best friend behind. And now he fled. He fled to Gath, we read in verse 10. And he fled to Gath, who is the enemy of Israel. And David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. Uh, some of us may be wondering now, didn't Psalm 34's title say that, you know, when he, was, when he went to Abimelech? But here it says in 1 Samuel chapter 21 that he went to Achish. Who is it? Achish or Abimelech? Well, Abimelech, uh, most scholars and commentators will note that it's actually the generic name of kings in the Old Testament. So you read of many Abimelechs, right? Because Abimelech in Hebrew means the father of king or father of the king. And so people would say, you know, in Psalm 34, the title is a generic name for a king. Uh, and now that we know that it's 1 Samuel chapter 21 that it refers to in the episode of David's life, it refers to Akish, who is the, well, that is the name of the king of Gath. And so he went to Achish, the king of Gath, and the servants of Achish said to him, Is not this David, the king of the land, or the, you know, the, the great man of the land? Did not they sing to one another of him in dances that Saul, oh, okay, thousands and ten thousands. Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands. And David, interestingly, if you were to proclaim, be, if you were being called the one who can slay ten thousands, wouldn't you be like brave and proud, you know, that you are able to do so? But interestingly, the next verse tells us that David took these words to heart and was much afraid. And in the original tense of the word afraid, it is an imperfect tense, a continually being afraid kind of meaning. It means that, the, that David was very much afraid continually of Akish, the king of Gath, to the point where David had to change his behaviour before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard, pretending to be insane, pretending to be mad, because David was very much afraid, continually. Proclaim as one who can slay the tens of thousands, and yet he was afraid. It showed his psyche at that point in time that he was not right with himself. He wasn't confident. He had lost his self-esteem because he had fled from his country. There was a loss of a dream in him. He had been anointed king when he was young, but now that dream, that dream had died because he had to flee from his country. He had to flee from his friend. I mean, not flee from his friend. He, he had to... He had to uh, go away from his friend, and now he's in the enemy territory, all alone. And so this Akish said to his servants, Behold, you see, uh, the man is mad. He's mad. Why then have you brought him to me? In fact, this king is saying, he's of no consequence at all. Do I like madmen that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? And we read that David departed from there and escaped, again, fleeing again, to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who, was, who, were, the, who were the people who were gathered around him, those who were in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was bitter in soul. These were people who were brokenhearted in every way, and they gathered to him. David, who had lost his best friend, David, who had lost his dignity, David is now at one of his lowest points in his life, and people could identify with him. People who were brokenhearted, distressed, in debt, and bitter in soul, they all gathered around him. This was his lowest point in his life.
But most interesting to me was the very next verse, or the next part of the verse that said, and he became commander over them. How could such a man of broken heartedness, a man who had lost everything, even himself, become a commander over people? And over people who were themselves broken hearted, in distress, and bitter in soul. And these were people who were there, there were over 400 of them. And it said here that David went from there to Mizpeh for Moab. And he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and mother stay with you. And here's a clue that we get of how he was able to do so, gathering people around him who would then become his men for the future, how he was being able to be commander over them. And we hear and see a glimpse here, till I know what God will do for me. There's a sense that even in his brokenness, even in his, uh, the lowest time of his life, he knows still that God is with him. He knows still that somehow God will do something for him. Maybe not now, but in the future. And now we go back to our scripture text where we see where he comes from. He says here that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. And many a times, isn't it, when we are brokenhearted, when there's the death of a loved one or a relationship or a dream, we feel as if all is lost and all have forsaken us. There's no one with us. And that was how David was, all alone, physically, but yet he knows that the Lord is near. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. And this theological truth of how God is near to the brokenhearted is what sustained him. And this theological truth of God's nearness reverbs through creation's history. We read in Genesis that when Adam and Eve sinned and they hid themselves from God, that God would be the one who will come near to them. God sought after them and God asked Adam and Eve, where are you? God went to be near with them. There's a nearness of God to Adam and Eve, even though they were in sin and He wanted to be with them. And we read of how Jesus in his last words, before he went back to heaven in his ascension, physically he would go back to heaven, but he said to his disciples, make disciples of all nations, and at the end, his very last words were, I am with you always to the end of age. Even when Jesus ascended to heaven, Jesus wanted them to know that he's still near them. He is with them to the end of the age. And of course, He promised the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come and descend upon His people, upon His disciples, and the Holy Spirit will be a counsellor to them. A counsellor who will be with them through the highs and the lows. A counsellor who will be with them in the times where they feel vulnerable and brokenhearted. The Holy Spirit comes and dwells with us. The Holy Spirit is near, so near that the Holy Spirit is with us. And then ultimately we read in Revelations 21 that Revelations would see, the time of Revelations would see a time where God will come once again physically with us. He will dwell with us. And that's the words we read from 21 verse 3, that God is with us, that God will dwell with men. This theological truth of God's nearness reverbs throughout creation's history. And there are times in our lives, in our brokenheartedness, where we feel as if we have been forsaken by all, including God, but God is near to the brokenhearted. Some of you would know that I'm a Liverpool fan. Uh, I'm a Liverpool fan. Uh, usually, you know, I will tell people I'm a Liverpool fan because it is very... Uh, Christian to be a Liverpool fan. Uh, we are always uh, saying that, uh, you know, we are hoping for the glorious day that will come one day. Uh, because for a long, long time, you know, uh, Liverpool wasn't winning anything. 
uh, that you know uh, the the club it's a club of family and the church is like a family. But most importantly, I think I like Liverpool because of a song that they sing, and the song is a song you never alone, and it goes like this. When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high and don't be afraid of the dark. At the end of a storm, there's a golden sky and the sweet silver song of a lark. Walk on through the wind, walk on through the rain, for your dreams be tossed and blown. Walk on, walk on with hope in your heart, and you never walk alone. You never walk alone. It's a sense of hope and a sense that. Indeed, we will not walk alone, even through the storms. And we need not be afraid of the dark. There's a sense that in the times when it's so dark, when it's so difficult, there's someone walking with us. And it's, to me, a very Christian song that God is near us and God walks with us. Bishop Dr. Gordon Wong, in a, number of, in a sermon a number of years ago, said these words. He said, what is worse than facing storms in our lives is facing storms in our lives alone. What is worse than facing storms in our lives is facing storms in our lives alone. And so it's important for us to know when we face storms in our lives, in our broken-hearted states, that God is with us. He is near to us. David says, the Lord is near. Not will be near, not can be near, but the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. And this nearness of God is that which gives him hope. You know, when we are all alone in the storm, it feels as if we have to fend for ourselves. And if we cannot fend for ourselves, and we think we cannot fend for ourselves, we give up. And the storms of our lives will overtake us. But because David knows that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, he's able to hope. He's able to press on. He's able to walk on. Because when the Lord is near, the Lord is able to save the crush in the spirit. Able to deliver him out of the afflictions. Able to keep his bones. Interestingly, you know, King David says, his Brokenhearted, and that's the literal word, literal word in the Hebrew. The heart is broken, brokenhearted, and yet God keeps his bones intact, and not any of his bones will be broken. When God is near, it gives us hope that we can press on, we can walk on, because God is the one who can save, he can deliver, and he keeps us in him. What do we do, though, when we are broken-hearted? There are many times, right, when we, feel, when we are in the state of broken-heartedness, we feel as if we cannot do anything. We don't have the energy to do anything. We don't have the hope to do anything. We, we, we are unable to fend for ourselves in any way. What then can we do? Well, the King David, in his state like this, starts off the psalm, interestingly, again, with praise. He praises God. He worships God. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise, his worship will be continually in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. And let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name all together. King David begins his psalm even in his state of having to flee from Saul, from his family, from his 
from his country, in a state where he's all alone, he can still say, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise, his worship should be continually on my mouth. He starts off with worship, with praise. And the praise of God somehow reminds him that God is near because we are proclaiming of God's presence, of God's goodness, of God's sovereignty, of God's power, even as we praise and worship God. And it reminds us that God is near. In the states where we are brokenhearted, we need to praise God. We need to still worship God. It's in our praise and our worship that we realize that the Lord is near. And when we realize the Lord is near, it gives us hope. And we can walk on, we can persevere on. And that was what happened to Lydia. Lydia and her husband chose this song to sing at the son's funeral, at Lucas's funeral. And she said that the songs we chose were very close to our hearts. As we sang these songs, we are reminded. They were reminded of God. They were reminded of the goodness of God. They were reminded that God is with them. And God is still good. And this is a song that goes like this. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. When we are brokenhearted and we praise and worship God, we are reminded that God is near, God is with us, and God is still good. And He gives us hope to still press on. How does God care for the brokenhearted? God reminds us that He is near. So we have to praise Him and worship Him. And in doing so, we can hope in Him once again, even in our brokenheartedness. Let me close with what John Wesley did. In 1788, just four years before John Wesley's own death, his very close brother passed away, Charles Wesley. They were so close that they would write to each other regularly, not emails, but uh, letters to one another, encouraging one another. They were so close that they actually gave permission to one another to review the potential spouse and give each other permission to say, no, this one, not good, you cannot marry her. And they were so close as brothers. And when Charles Wesley passed away at the age of 80 in 1988, John Wesley was brokenhearted. And at Charles Wesley's funeral, John Wesley chose to lead this song, this hymn, Come, O thou traveller unknown. And at the second, third line, John Wesley broke down and cried. But it was a hymn, hymn written by Charles Wesley himself that would encourage John, even in this state of brokenheartedness. It speaks of a desire for the Lord to come near, even in his brokenheartedness so that he might want to, once again be able to press on with life. And I'm going to close with this hymn, which we will sing later in our hymn of response. My prayer is that for those of us who are brokenhearted, may this traveller unknown, who is God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, may he come near to you and walk with you. Come, O thou traveller unknown, whom still I hold, but cannot see my company before is gone, and I am left alone with thee. 
With thee all night I mean to stay and wrestle till the break of day. With thee all night I mean to stay and wrestle till the break of day. And this verse, this love, this love thou dies for me, I hear thy whisper in my heart. The morning breaks, the shadows flee, pure universal love thou art. To me, to all thy mercies move, thy nature and thy name is love. To me, to all thy mercies move, Thy nature and thy name is love. In our broken heartedness, may we praise God and know that He is near so that we can press on and walk on with God. Let us pray together. Brothers and sisters, as I was committing this sermon to the Lord and praying, I sense that some of us are going through times of brokenheartedness even in our lives right now. Death of a loved one. A death of a relationship. Perhaps the death of a dream. And as I was praying, I felt a deep ache in my heart. Perhaps for some of you, that's something that you are feeling right now in your own lives. A sense that you cannot even breathe at times. A sense that the heart is So broken that this ache just will not go away. I felt as if my own heart was aching. But you know, the Lord is near. The Lord is near to you. Perhaps you can't sense it. Perhaps you can't feel it. But the Lord is near. And this truth of God's nearness is something that God wants you to know today. That you are not alone in this. There is hope still is God is near to you. The end of the tunnel is not something that is dark, even though right now it seems as if all is dark around. But the end of the tunnel sees the Lord still walking with you. Always walking with you. The Lord wants to carry you. And the Lord will carry you. So press on, my brothers and sisters. Hang on with hope. For even though you may not sense Him or feel Him currently, the Lord is near to you. And so Lord, we pray that you will come near to all of us.
so that, Lord, for those of us who are brokenhearted, we may be able to walk on with hope and with perseverance in knowing that our Lord is always near. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.